Welcome, it's day six of 365, and today we're gonna to be talking about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, as well as God's mercy. Today we're gonna to be reading from Genesis 19 and 21, but before we get started, let us pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, God, we come to you humble and really truly honoring this divine appointment that we get to have with you each and every day as we seek your face, as we seek the kingdom first, because we know everything should be added onto us. You allow the word to come alive. You allow it to fill our spirits. On today, God, we just ask that you have your will and your way in our lives, God. God, as we take this time to devote to you, we humble ourselves because we know that all goodness comes from you and we want to seek you. We want to have you more in our life. God, we ask that you just allow us to continuously seek you, to continuously want to know more about your word and that you allow this word to affect our lives in a positive manner and that we extract every lesson and blessing that we can gain from this. This and many more blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. In chapter 19, we see Sodom and Gomorrah get destroyed, but we also find out why and we see how wicked these people truly are. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting at the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, here now, my lords, please turn into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet that you may arise early and go on your way. And they said, no, we will spend the night in the open square. But he insisted strongly. So they turned into him and entered his house. Then he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread and they ate. The Bible says in verse three, but he insisted strongly. And we get this sense that there's a real reason why, right? There's a real reason why Lot wants them to, wants these two angels to be with him and turn into his house. And it's because he knows that the people of Sodom are wicked. And it's like, it's like a double-edged sword, like understanding that not only is, are they wicked, but it seems like he's trying to protect them, right? He's trying to protect these angels from what may happen to them if they are out in the open. Now before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people in every quarter surrounded the house. And they all called to Lot and said to him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so we may know them carnally. And what this is saying is that all the men, young and old of Sodom, have came to Lot's house because they want to have sex with the two men. Not only is it sexual immorality, but it's also rape. And it's just an example of how wicked these people of Sodom were. So Lot went out to them through the doorway, shut the door behind him, and he said, Please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. See now, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please let me bring them out to you, and you may do to them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men since this is the reason that they have come under the shadow of my roof. There's a lot to unpack here, but the first thing we see is how desensitized Sodom is to perversion. Lot is willing to give this huge group of men his two daughters, knowing what they may do to them. The second thing is these men of Sodom do not know who Lot's company is. See, Lot knows because he's greeted them, he, and he also has addressed to them as my lords, and he knows that these are angels. Well, because of these wicked customs of Sodom, we're actually going to be able to learn a lesson here. Then they said, this one came in to stay here, and he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. So they pressed hard against the man Lot and came near to break the door down. But the men reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck the men who were in the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great. So they became weary trying to find the door. This would be a spectacle to see. Imagine these spiritually blind men now becoming physically blind and then struggling, wearying, trying to find the door. An important detail here is that the Bible says small and great, letting us know that the amount of spiritual blindness that these people had was also the amount of physical blindness that they were cursed with. Then the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who married his daughters, and said, Get up and get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. Here we see that Lot is urgently trying to let his family know, Stop what you're doing, get out of the city, because God is about to destroy Sodom for the wickedness. And his family begins to laugh. He thinks that he's joking. This is probably because his walk isn't in alignment with his faith. Meaning you can say that you're a man of God, but when I look at you, 
do you look like a man of God? And because contextually, we can see that Lot is a leader in Sodom and he's used to perversion, willing to give up his two daughters to this group of men, I think it's easy for us to say that Lot has kind of lost his way. But this can be a major lesson for us to make sure that our walk is in alignment with our faith, that when somebody sees us and we say that we are men and women of God, that our actions are actually matching up to what we're saying. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. The reason why he lingered is because his sons-in-law aren't there because they still think it's a joke. So it came to pass, and when they brought them outside, that he said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. Quick side note. Please remember that the angel just said, do not look behind you. Then Lot said to them, please know my lords, indeed your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, lest some evil overtake me and I die. See now this city is near enough to flee to, and it's a little one. Please let me escape there. Is it not a little one, and my soul shall live? And he said to him, see I have favored you concerning this thing also, and that I will not overtake this city, for which I have spoken. Hurry, escape here, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. The sun had rise upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So he overthrew these cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But his wife looked back behind him and she became a pillar of salt. There are some things in our lives that God does not want us to look back to. Because he is moving us so forward, he wants our direction and our focus to be all on moving forward. Because if we were to look back, if we were to look back on the things that he's already delivered us from, it could be distracting and it could also lead us to going back into temptation. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. Then he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain. And he saw and behold, the smoke of the land which went up like a smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow, and he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. Then Lot went up to Zorar and dwelt in the mountains, and his two daughters were with him, for he was afraid to dwell in Zorar. Now the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is no man on earth to come into us, as is the custom of all the earth. Come let us make our father drink wine, and we lie with him, that we may preserve the lineage of our father. So they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went and laid with her father, and he did not know when she laid down or when she arose. And it happened on the next day that the firstborn said to the younger, Indeed, I lay with my father last night, and you go in and lie with him, that we may preserve the lineage of our father. Then they made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger arose and lay with him, and he did not know when she laid down or when she arose. Thus both daughters of Lot were with child by their father. The firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. And the younger she also bore a son and named him ben -Ami. He is the father of the people of Ammon to this day. Okay, in biblical times, it's actually known as a disgrace if a woman cannot fulfill her duties to forward the lineage of her father. But even during this time, it is not normal to be having sex with your parents outside of Sodom. And it just lets us know like how perverse and immoral these people were. Chapter 20. And Abraham journeyed from there to the south, and he dwelt between Kadesh, Shur, and stayed in Gerar. Now Abraham said to his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night, and he said, Indeed you are a dead man, because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And she, even she said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocence of my hands, I have done this. And God said to him in a dream, yes, I know you have did this in the integrity of your heart. For also I have withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now, therefore, restore a man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die. You and all who are yours. So Abimelech rose early in the morning, called his servants, and told all these things in their hearing. And the men were very much afraid. And Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? How have I offended you, that you have brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? 
you have done these to me that ought not be done. Then Abimelech said to Abraham, what did you have in view that you would have done these things? And Abraham said, because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place and they will kill me on account of my wife. But indeed, she is truly my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house. And I said to her, this is your kindness that you shall do for me. In every place, wherever we shall go, save me. He is my brother. Then Abimelech took sheep, oxen, and male and female servants and gave them to Abraham. And he restored Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, see, my land there is before you. Dwell there where it pleases you. Then to Sarah he said, behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Indeed, this vindicates you before all who are with you and before everybody. Thus she was rebuked. So Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his female servants. Then they bore a child. For the Lord had closed up all wombs of the house of Abimelech because Sarah, Abraham's wife. So we see that Abraham and Sarah are doing it again, but we also see how, like I said before, amazing and devoted Sarah is. But even better than that, we see how faithful God is to his promises because God said that Abraham will be blessed and that he will make him a great nation. And we're seeing it here that God continuously, as Abraham goes from place to place and he follows and he is devoted and obedient to where God is telling him to go, he keeps getting richer and richer. His wealth keeps multiplying. And we just see all these things working in Abraham's favor. In chapter 21, we see one of God's promises being fulfilled to Abraham. We also see some conflict again from Sarah and Hagar bumping heads. And we also see a new covenant between Abraham and Abimelech. Chapter 21. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son, who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight years old, as God had commanded him. Now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh, and all who hear will laugh with me. She also said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. Here we see that God has fulfilled a promise that he made to Abraham and he told to Sarah. And we see that she is still in disbelief. Even though it just happened, even though she just experienced it and has bore the child, she still can believe that her, being known as a barren woman, God has provided and has allowed her to bore Isaac. So she grew the child and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw that the son Hagar, the Egyptian woman who she had born to Abraham, was scoffing. Therefore she said to Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be the heir with my son namely with Isaac. And the matter of this was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. So here we see that Abraham is saddened by this because he still sees Ishmael as his firstborn because he is his firstborn. Even though God has already told Abraham what he has in plan for Isaac and that through Isaac, the covenant will remain. But God said to Abraham, do not let this be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. For in Isaac, your seed shall be called. Yet I will also make a nation of the son of the bondwoman, because he is your seed. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water, and putting it on her shoulder, and he gave it and the boy to Hagar, and sent her away. Then she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba, and the water of the skin was used up, and she placed the boy under one of the shrubs. Then she went and sat down across from him at a distance of about a bowshot. For she said to herself, Let me not see the death of the boy. So she sat opposite of him and lifted her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. Then the angel of God called out to Hagar, out of heaven, and he said to her, What ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad. Where is he? Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in your hand, for I will make him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And when she went and filled the skin with water, she gave the lad a drink. So God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness, and became an archer. He dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him in the land of Egypt. Here we see God clocking in just at the right time in the miracle-making business. He heard Hagar's cries, and he made something out of nothing. What we can personally extract from this is that nothing is too difficult for God. God can literally do the impossible. How do we know? 
because we've seen him do it. And the amazing thing about this is that this is the God we serve, the same God who can make a well of water appear in the middle of the desert is the same God who we serve now here today. So just be encouraged that if he can do it for her, he can do it for you. And it came to pass that at the time of Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army spoke to Abraham saying, God is with you in all that you do. Therefore, swear to me by God that you will not deal falsely with me, with my offspring or with my posterity, but that according to the kindness that I have done for you, you will do to me and to the land in which you have dwelt. And Abraham said, I swear. Then Abraham rebuked Abimelech because of the well of the water which Abimelech's servants had seized. And Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, nor have I heard it until today. So Abraham took the sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two of them made a covenant. And Abraham set the seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. Then Abimelech asked Abraham, What is the meaning of the seven ewe lambs which you have set by themselves? And he said, You will take these seven ewe lambs from my hand, and be my witness that I have dug this well. Therefore he called that place Bathsheba, because of the two who swore an oath there. Thus they made a covenant at Bathsheba. So Abimelech rose with Phicol, the commander of his army, and returned to the land of Philistines. Then Abraham planted a tiramis tree in Bathsheba, and there he called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham stayed in the land of the Philistines many days. This wraps up day six of studying and reading the Bible with me. I appreciate everybody who's watching and listening to this. And if this was a blessing to you, make sure you share it with three other people who need to hear this too. And I'll see you on day seven. Peace.